Hello! This is Anna, the Pretty Shepherd, and today we are going to do something a little bit different than what we usually do here on my channel. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably know that in these last couple of weeks, or more like months, I've been working on a little sewing project of mine, a folk costume vest. And in this video, I want to tell you a little bit about how it came to be. It's historical and folkloric background, so if you care for that, please continue watching. First and foremost, since I have a pretty international audience, uh, I will have to tackle a little bit of history and geography. This folk costume piece is from the region of Haromsik. Literally three chairs, I kid you not, three chairs which is a part of Sikhaifud, which itself is a part of Transylvania. Today, this piece of land belongs to Romania, but historically speaking, for a very long time, it was part of Hungary. So Haromsik is the furthest eastern corner of Transylvania, which in a sense might make you think that it may have been a little bit industrially and uh, technologically backwards, but it was not. In fact, there are some very well-traveled people of the 19th century who noted that Haromsik was a very industrially developed area. Steam machines and engines and agricultural innovations going on there. With all these modern commodities, it is very interesting to think about how this part of the country still decided to put a very strong emphasis on maintaining the folkloric elements of their attire. I mean, they were very well developed, so they could have had access to more modern fabrics and prints and cottons and so on, and yet their folk costume is very archaic. The typical costumes from here are made from hand-woven fabrics, and this was still a custom up to even the 70s or the 80s, when people finally let go of their folk costumes. These handwoven fabrics from this area were usually striped ones. And similarly to Scottish tartan, the colored stripes had their own meaning and significance. For instance, they could symbolize a certain family, but I'll get back to this part a little bit later. Some of you already asked on Instagram if there is a good resource for finding out more about them. And the best resource that you can get is this, CK people in their Sunday best. So this book is about the larger region, the Sekeifud. The sad thing about this book is that whilst it is the best material to learn from at present, it is still very lacking. Don't get me wrong, it's an amazing book. It is probably my favorite Transylvanian resource. However, when one tackles such a large geographical area, it's impossible to dive deep enough into the details. And what I mean about that is, a girl would wear a different costume in winter than she would wear in summer. That's pretty evident. She would also wear something different when she was going to church or when she was working in the fields. Also pretty evident. And another very important factor is that a person would wear different costumes throughout their whole life. As in, a little girl would wear something different than a big girl, and then something different as a married woman without children, and then a married woman with children, and then an old woman or a widow. So there are all these stages and all these different costumes. And then you have this book, which in the instance of some villages has only one picture, like one single costume. This is what I mean about lacking. It's still amazing, I still love it dearly and it does dive deepest into the details. These are dresses from Haromsik. As you can see them, there is something very typical about the skirts, the vests, well, the fabric in general. They have this very specific so-called cloudy weave to them, which is achieved by using more than one colored thread in one stripe, creating a mix of the two colors when looked at from afar, and then a detailed texture when examined from up close. So, when I found this skirt in a thrift store, you can imagine how I thought to myself, this is perfect for me, right? Wrong. <laughs> Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! Remember when I said that all the colors had some sort of meaning to them? Allow me to elucidate some of these color codes. But first, a disclaimer! So the color codes that I'm going to present to you are more of a rule of thumb and not really carved in stone 
this is what it means and that's that. So their meaning may vary from village to village. With that out of the way, here is my guideline to interpreting colors in Seike costumes. Red is for youth, so especially for little girls. Black means mourning. The more a person progressed in their life, obviously they would lose more and more people around them, so they would have more of a warning color in their clothes. Thus, toward the end of their lives, making it mostly black, if not completely black. Blue is for nobility. There's a very interesting concept of shared nobility in Seike food, which basically means that they are all noble, but they are still kind of like village people. They're just not peasants. Fun fact, if the king of Hungary would have rode through one of these villages, all those people working in the fields and, you know, in their raggedy work clothes, they wouldn't actually have to tip their hat because they were basically nobles too. You there, good man. Hello, I am a man and I am the king of this country. Ah, good day. I am also a man. And I am but a simple cow herder. Is that so? Yes. Very well, I'll be off then. Goodbye. Goodbye. <coughs> Green is for land, especially forest. Brown is for animals, cattle and sheep, probably mostly sheep. With this knowledge in mind, you can look at the color scheme of this fabric again and see how this is probably not fit for me, being unmarried and without children. So all of these colors had different meaning. I think to some extent it was kind of sort of nice because you could look at a person and you could read a lot just from their appearance. But please let me know in the comments below what you think. Should clothing be a way of expressing who you are inside and outside? Or is it better not to judge people based on their appearances? Comment below, I would love to join in on the discussion and I would really like to see different viewpoints and just get a sense of where people stand in this subject. When I decide I want to make the costume of a certain village, I generally prefer to go to that village and do the research myself talk to the elderly, look at original pieces, and if I'm lucky, maybe some photographs, because they often retain some details which have been already forgotten. However, with the strange situation that the world is in right now, travel was out of the question. <laughs> Usually I like to make my costumes to be inspired from one particular village, so as to stay true to a very local aesthetic. However, just this once, I took inspiration from a wider area, all of Haromsik. After doing the right amount of research, my design process goes a little bit something like this. I try to figure out the rules, in the sense that I need to know what was definitely always the norm. It also helps to know about the things that they would never do, like if there are certain rules that they would never bend. And when I have my general set of do's and don'ts, I like to move on to isolated examples. It could be the particular taste of one girl who was a little bit different than the others, or it could just be something that belonged to an older fashion, which someone just decided to sentimentally stick to. And it is often these isolated particularities that I find the most inspiration in. There's also sort of an art to figuring out how to talk to the elderly village people. Ananini, can you tell me a little bit more about the costumes that you used to wear when you were a little girl and... You know, the usual, just what everybody wore at the time. And uh, do you remember what the other women wore around you? Like your mother or your sister? Oh, you know, nothing special, just the usual fabric. Red, uh, black, uh, what we like at the time. Okay, it was like that. Everybody wore what they had at home. That's it. May I, um, wh what about, what about this photo over here? I remember, yes. My sister, she went to be a maid in the city. She bought herself a singer sewing machine. She was a maid at the house of a very famous singer. Uh, 
She was a opera singer, you know, in the song where they go. Londonban hey, van számos utca, és minden utcán több sarok, és minden sarkon vannak házak, és minden házon ablakok. You know? Well, she sang in that one, and um, my sister was taking care of her clothes, so she studied them. And when she came home, with her zinger sewing machine. She started making the most beautiful reklis for everybody in the village. It was the new fashion. And did the little girls also wear this? No, little girls, uh, they didn't wear this. This was for girls who wanted to get married already. You know how it is, you know. What about on Sundays? Was this something for that- Sundays, oh. of course. This was only for Sundays. We didn't wear this kind of special silk and brocade uh, only around the village. It was so expensive. Mm. My sister, she could make the clothes, but the fabric was still a lot of money. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, I told you, it's just the usual. We wore what people had at home. And then uh, sometimes uh, people had uh, something special at home. So it was along these steps that I ended up with my own design. Which as you can see features a lot of the fabric on its own. I really wanted to let the stripes speak for themselves. But apart from that I did want to use a decent amount of velvet. As black velvet was usually a symbol of wealth, it was pretty expensive. At a certain point in history about 30 or 40 centimeters of black velvet would cost just as much as two oxen, which is crazy and people still bought it because they wanted their daughters to look decent and presentable and wealthy. So uh, yeah, fashion is crazy sometimes. <laughs> Some other design elements that I knew I really wanted to include were the so-called wolf's teeth along the neckline, some beading with sequins, and also a stylized, a little bit art deco-esque tulip in the back. But more about these in the next video. Uh, I'm sorry I have to break this up into more parts, but this is already so much information and I really want to do this subject justice. So I'd rather tackle it in a little bit more time along a couple of episodes. I hope you enjoyed this video, even if it's a little bit different from what I usually do. Um, if you like my hairstyle, you can try out, uh, here's a link for that. If you want more pictures of my vest, you can follow me on Instagram. If you've enjoyed this video and you are curious to find out what is going to happen to this little project of mine, then please subscribe to my channel as I am going to post a new episode in two weeks. New video every two weeks. This is something that I can keep to and I can manage. So um, that's that. That's a promise I can make. And sometimes maybe I'm going to surprise you with another extra video wedged in between. Who knows? But video every second Friday. Bye bye! <laughs> Would you smash this? Hmm?